Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record in state versus Brooks. Appearances are as they were before. I want to give you all a little bit of my roadmap for my remarks here today and what will ultimately conclude with the sentencing. I'm going to start with a review, frankly, of Mr. Brooks's NGI plea. Now, I didn't, wasn't going to start out doing that, um, but I feel compelled to make a record of certain things in light of many of the statements that were made here today by Mr. Brooks and his family. Following that, I'm going to talk about the case, the strength of the case, the witnesses and evidence that was presented, uh, and some of the things that really impacted me throughout that time um, and throughout the nearly four weeks of trial. Then I will spend some time talking about the victims, their victim impact statements, and again, things that have stood out here to me. I cannot comment on all of the victim statements that have been made, um, but there are a few that I do want to highlight. And then ultimately, um, go through the sentencing factors. Because all of these things that I'm going to talk about relate to those factors, which in Wisconsin there are three primary factors, the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and the character and rehabilitative needs of the defendant. So I want to start sort of near the end of all of the remarks over the last couple of days, and that is with my thoughts on Mr. Brooks and his mental health. I'm not here to debate that you have had a history over time of intersecting with the mental health agencies and that you may have in your history trauma, um, emotional pain, and things of that nature. Um, I have read through not one, not two, not three, but four reports from experts, people who are well known in this field of what we call forensic psychology and psychiatry, individuals who have an expertise in evaluating a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Because I don't want there to be any doubt in my sentencing here today that I've considered that. But I also don't want there to be any doubt that somehow this trial was missing something. Because the fact is Mr. Brooks entered a special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect uh, in the early summer, maybe late spring of this year. And this court ordered three court ordered evaluations and the state retained an expert to also review the issue. Whether the defense team at that point ever hired anyone, uh, I am, they are not required to disclose that, I don't know. But I have four well-known doctors um, who have written this court based upon the orders that were made or the person, one doctor being retained. And these are reports that are thorough uh, one report is 24 pages, another is more of a summary, it's eight pages, another is 26 pages, and then another is 12. And they look at the discovery information, so police reports, videographic evidence, things of that nature. They have access to any mental health related records from prior stays or things like that. They look at a history, they do they meet with Mr. Brooks. I've referenced this in the past when competency wasn't so much raised by any of the parties here, but during the trial there was, as uh, Attorney Opper uh, wanted to make a record one day of Mr. Brooks's competency. 
And I will restate what I stated at that point. I have absolutely no doubt that Mr. Brooks is competent. I'm obviously well-versed in the legal standard, um, but that is not something that this court was frankly ever concerned about at any point in time. I know that his attorneys, when he had attorneys, never raised the issue. Um, and it was really only after the trial began that that issue was raised, I think, by the public based upon what they saw. But Attorney Opper, like myself, had the benefit of having reviewed each and every one of these examinations. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important because it goes also to Mr. Brooks's character, which is one of the things that this court must consider along with his rehabilitative needs. And I'm going to read parts of these evaluations so that you all understand the information that I have and why it is my opinion that mental health issues did not cause him to do what he did on November 21 of 2021 and frankly did not play a role. That's not to say that he wasn't diagnosed with something. I've referenced this previously, but that's an antisocial personality disorder. And this is what one of the reports has to say. They've looked at uh, one doctor indicated that there was available evidence to sustain a diagnosis of cannabis abuse, intoxication, antisocial personality disorder, adjustment disorder with mixed disturbance of emotions and conduct. And the reports go on to describe what those things are and that they may qualify as an abnormal condition of the mind substantially affecting mental or emotional processes and thus as a mental disease or defect as broadly defined by the Wisconsin jury instructions, and that's at least as to the adjustment disorder. Cannabis abuse or intoxication would not. Um, the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, and this is what the doctor said, reflects converging support of an underlying character logical disorder versus a major mental illness. In Mr. Brooks's case, I would note his history of disregarding the rights of others and conforming to societal norms, including in the forms of multiple acts of violence beginning in his youth, contacts with the criminal justice system, lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent, rationalizing, etc. The doctor goes on that it's her understanding that this character logical condition would not qualify as a mental disease or defect as defined by the applicable statute, which also specifies that mental disease or defect does not include an abnormality manifested only by repeated criminal or otherwise antisocial conduct. Goes on to talk about her opinion regarding criminal non-responsibility. And the examiner rendered an opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty that there was not support for the defendant's special plea, that the facts at hand do not sustain a conclusion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty that because of symptoms of a mental disease or defect, Mr. Brooks was rendered to lack substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the alleged misconduct or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law at the time in question. In arriving at this opinion, the following considerations were significant to this examiner. While acknowledging Mr. Brooks' documented history of episodic contacts with mental health professionals beginning in adolescence, most of the time he has had such contacts or received mental health treatment when in custody. In effect, there is not a sustained, documented history of a diagnosed major mental illness for him predating the alleged offense or otherwise. Looked at a psychiatric review from April of 2010, uh, at that point, the defendant was determined to have no medically determinable impairment on which to qualify for disability benefits. The consultant who conducted the review noted that Mr. Brooks claimed mental illness was not, quote, well established, quote, that the statements that he made at that point were not deemed credible, they were inconsistent and not verified by treatment providers in the community. 
Factor number two, the defendant's history of violence be beginning years predating the alleged offense is significant. He faced multiple prior domestic related charges. He was not permitted in his mother's home because of the history of violence. To be sure, the magnitude and lethality of Mr. Brooks's violence in the commission of the alleged offenses is more severe than what was previously known. However, the defendant's history of a pattern of violent behavior, coupled with other aspects of his history, and in this and this case, strongly suggests that his mental state, which produced the alleged offenses, was most fundamentally formed and fueled by contributions of his underlying characterological dysfunction, anger and rage born of his conflict with his girlfriend moments before the Christmas parade tragedy. The examiner considered Mr. Brooks's episodic endorsement of auditory hallucinations, including on clinical interview with the undersigned, meaning the examiner, and in a couple of recorded jail phone calls subsequent to his arrest. She said this, I am unaware of any objective cooperation that he presented either in the hours leading up to or following the alleged offenses as internally preoccupied or otherwise exhibiting signs of impaired reality, contact, or behavioral discontrol. To the contrary, the defendant's conduct within hours of the onset and moments following the alleged misconduct was organized, controlled, and purposeful. Moreover, he demonstrated the motivation and capacity to take efforts to evade detection and try to flee the immediate area of the parade carnage. She went on, I have considered the seemingly inexplicable nature and magnitude of the violence and mayhem wrought by the defendant's conduct on the day in question. He has caused six death, deaths, dozens of injuries, and terrorized hundreds of parade participants and thousands of spectators. There is no indication in the extensive compilation of records and other information available that at the time of the alleged misconduct, he lacked substantial capacity to either control or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law, or that his reality contact capacity to appreciate wrongfulness was substantially impaired. In the context of rage born of his conflict and altercation with his former girlfriend turmoil, the defendant was disinclined to control his behavior or attend to its consequences. Notwithstanding the magnitude of the violence in this case, a mental disease or defect is not defined by the unnaturalness or enormity of the act. Moreover, temporary passion or frenzy prompted by revenge hatred, jealousy, envy, or the like does not constitute a mental disease or defect. She goes on to talk about the course of functioning of Mr. Brooks during the day leading up to the alleged offense, uh, does not suggest that he was behavior, behaviorally dysregulated or that his reality contact was impaired. Um, goes on to talk about what he did in the immediate aftermath of the parade, including fleeing the vicinity, um, making efforts to evade detection or responsibility, um, and other things. Went on to discuss other evidence, including uh, the videographic evidence of the ring doorbell and being on the porch where he sought to use the phone, um, he had apparently discarded a couple of small bags, later determined to contain marijuana, and presumably, this is the examiner again, he discarded items to evade responsibility for possessing them. By implication, such conduct strongly suggests his capacity to appreciate wrongfulness was then intact. When responding to law enforcement officials, he followed their commands. He lowered himself to the ground. We saw that on the recording of his arrest when he was taken into custody and detained. None of the behaviors nor verbal remarks at the time of the arrest suggest he was behaviorally dysregulated or that his reality contact was impaired. 
Following his arrest and being taken into custody, he engaged in an informal series of verbal exchanges with authorities. And none of his statements taken at face value suggest he was then actively psychotic or that his behavior controls were substantially impaired. She then goes on to talk about the Mirandai statements. This court personally watched every minute of that interaction with Detective Carpenter and Detective Stern, along with the one from the night before, which was at the hospital within hours. Um, and I would concur with the examiner's conclusions that the contact of context, excuse me, no, sorry, the content of his initial statements to authorities included multiple efforts to deceive or mislead. He changed his story multiple times, including he initially denied being in Waukesha the prior Saturday. He initially asserted he traveled to Waukesha on the day in question in a tan Kia with a friend. He initially asserted his mother did not own a vehicle, though later acknowledged as much, and that he used it from time to time. Other changes in his story over the course of his statements and the nature of them further suggest that he was making active attempts to evade detection or responsibility. By implication, such behavior strongly suggests that his reality contact was then intact. When he was shown photographs of driving in the SUV into the parade route, he indicated it was not him. And this is again the examiner. Uh, I'm sorry, with the police. She's noting the police contact. It was not until Mr. Brooks was in the booking area of the Waukesha County Jail that he displayed some emotion. And this was to, I believe, Detective Stern, where he was where he said, I didn't mean to kill nobody. Such a remark indicates an awareness of the consequences of his actions and runs counter to a conclusion of an exculpatory mental disease or defect. There's other criteria or other factors. I'm not gonna read them all. That was probably one of the more comprehensive explanations of why that examiner uh, did not conclude that there was support for the special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. All four examiners shared similar uh, observations. Certainly their conclusions were that there was not support for the special plea. Um, they, one examiner uh, talked about, again, conduct after driving through the parade, abandoning the vehicle used in the act, uh, altering his appearance by removing his outer layer of clothing, clothing, altering how he was wearing his hair, and then engaging in further efforts to leave the scene by securing transportation via a ride-sharing application. This particular examiner went on to say, while he essentially, meaning Mr. Brooks, disclaimed any memory of those actions and could therefore not explain them, such behaviors strongly suggest an awareness of wrongdoing and a desire to avoid detection. Another examiner had very similar things, antisocial personality disorder with borderline features, talked about the cannabis use disorder and full remission in a controlled environment. What's interesting about this particular report is the description of an antisocial personality disorder. The DSM-5 defines antisocial personality disorder as a pervasive pattern of disregard for a violation of the rights of others occurring since age 15 years, as indicated by three or more of the following. Failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors, as indicated by repeated performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Two, deceitfulness, as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Three, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Four, irritability and aggressiveness, as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Five, Reckless disregard for safety of self and others. Six, consistent irresponsibility, as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior 
or on our financial obligations. Seven, lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. In addition, the individual is at least 18 years old and there is evidence of a conduct disorder prior to the age of 15. This examiner noted Mr. Brooks meets nearly all of the symptoms described above because he has exhibited a long-term maladaptive pattern of behavior involving a disregard for and violation of the rights of others, beginning in childhood and continuing through adult life. The borderline features reflect a general inability to sustain healthy relationships with others, including his domestically violent relationship with victim PPP. That examiner goes on with further analysis and conclusions, again, finding that there is not support. Um, the last examiner, again, made similar conclusions, also diagnosing Mr. Brooks with an antisocial personality disorder. Why is that important? There is no doubt that in our criminal justice system today, we face a crisis of the mentally ill intersecting in our courts. In the last year and a half alone, this court has ordered many competency evaluations, presided over a number of contested competency hearings, and ordered many, many evaluations for the special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. And the bottom line is, for this court, Mr. Brooks does not present as a person who is either not competent or not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. It is frankly heartbreaking to see those individuals who truly suffer from schizophrenia, for example, intersect in our criminal justice system. Sometimes they do unspeakable things. They hurt other people. Um, I'm thinking of one such gentleman who was so schizophrenic and out of control. He couldn't even be kept in the courtroom. He was too loud. He clearly, if you've ever been in the room with someone who is suffering from auditory or visual hallucinations, it is not something you easily forget. It makes an impression, even on someone like myself who's not an MD or a doctorate level psychologist. I've been in the room with an individual who was, uh, when I did defense work, and he was accused of killing someone near and dear to him. It's a very, very different presentation. It's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. Do the mentally ill sometimes commit atrocious crimes? They do. This is not one of those situations. We've heard Mr. Brooks's family talk about mental illness and bipolar. You know, in addition, and before I get to that, I've also had over my 11 years on the bench of coming face to face with evil on occasion. There are many times, many times, good people do bad things, but there are times when evil people do bad things. There is no medication or treatment for a heart that is bent on evil. Child trauma, bipolar, indifference, physical abuse of a child, or even childhood trauma did not cause Daryl Brooks to commit the acts for which he will be sentenced here today. It is very clear to this court that he understands the difference between right and wrong, and that he simply chooses to ignore his conscience. He is fueled by anger and rage. Some people, unfortunately, choose a path of evil, and I think, Mr. Brooks, you are one of those such persons. As a mom, my heart breaks for your family, for your mom, and for your grandmother. The son that she raised, the grandson that your grandmother knew, the hopes and dreams they had for your life, they're gone. 
And I think it's perhaps far easier for them to blame a mental illness than to perhaps come to grips with their son did very, very bad things due to very bad motivations. One of the things ultimately that will happen when you are in prison, sir, is that the Department of Corrections, they are statutorily responsible for your care and your well-being, including your mental health. I do not have any authority to dictate to them where you go or how they treat you. That is far different than when there is support for a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect because then the court has available what is called um, treatment facilities um, and a commitment to such uh, a treatment facility. That is something that is simply not on the table. And again, for evaluations, not even my own assessment, but for evaluations from licensed professionals say otherwise, even in the face of your family saying that and even in the face of you claiming that. I'm not even here to say that some of those things can't coexist and that you might not have some of your own mental health issues, whether it be bipolar, childhood trauma, or things of that nature. But the bottom line is none of that caused you to do what you did on November 21 of 2021. I want to next turn to the trial in this case. And I think it's important that the sentence here today focuses on your conduct on November 21 of 2021 and the moments leading up to that tragic and fateful decision of yours to drive through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and of course the moments after. I of course through my sentencing remarks and ultimately what I do here today, I can't answer all of the questions. I can't address all of the issues, including the why. Perhaps the one question that will remain unanswered. Why? Why did you barrel down White Rock Avenue? Why did you not stop? Why did you keep going? Many of us in this courtroom sat through the entire trial. And what we learned is that very early on in the afternoon of November 21, starting at around 1 p.m., the police got ready for the parade. The staging area was um, set up, and that was all along White Rock Avenue. Signs were put in place. Ultimately, barricades were put up um, at a number of locations on Main Street and surrounding that. We know because we heard from Sergeant Warner uh, about what he had done and he had, right before the start of the parade, had driven down the parade route. He had, it was on his shoulders, his responsibility to make sure everything was safe and in order. What's important about that staging area, sir, is we know that that is where the altercation with Erica Patterson really came to a head. We all watched that video, multiple videos. And we know that even before that, you appeared angry and upset. Two individuals uh, testified about you being at that mobile gas station, how you turned the wrong way down a one-way street, waved your hands in the air, rolled down your window, either exchanged gestures or words with one of the drivers. Perhaps 30 minutes or so before the start of the parade, maybe an hour or so before you drove down the parade route. 
but what's important is the signage. Even you, at one point, I believe when you were talking with Detective Carpenter, noted, um, it was my words, my assessment, it was clear something was going on. I think what you said was a lot of shit was blocked off. You'd driven past those signs on the staging area. The fact remains they were there, sir. And the fact remains is you told Detective Carpenter that. The other, we then heard from The witnesses related to Ms. Patterson, we heard from Corey Runkle, we heard from Erica Patterson herself. My impression, based upon Erica Patterson's testimony, who by the way, she showed grace and dignity facing you, the man who clearly has no regard for her as a mother of one of your children, as someone you had a, a domestic partnership with and a relationship with at one point. That's not true. We know, and I would say this goes to your character, what was shown through that altercation and going up the hill, following her, slapping her. You know, the rules don't matter to you, not the rules of the road, not the rules established by court orders, not the rules even of decorum and decency. And I'll get to this more fully when I talk about your character. And I know you went hard at Attorney Opper for her bringing these things up, but those are legitimate, lawful sentencing considerations. And when I get to that point, I'll tell you the case law that supports that. Your character, your even your pending cases. I don't need no case law. We know at the time of all of this, right, you were out on bond for two felony cases, one involving a handgun, one involving the same vehicle in Erica Patterson, and one involving ultimately intimidation of Ms. Patterson. We know that you, that on November 20th, and she was very contrite about this, she told you where she was, she, she invited you out there. And that you had contact with her on the 20th. There was Never some had physical. Contact with her on the 20th. Mr. Brooks, this is my time. That's you need reason, to not interrupt. That's the reason why the, uh, the charge was dropped. Mr. Brooks, the state you need to said stop. specifically, wrote you, Your Honor, and said that they know it was no incident that day. Mr. And Brooks, now you want to sit up here. Do not interrupt me you, or you will be removed to and, the other and courtroom. And now you want to sit up here. Stop. And try, to, now. and try to add something in that you know for a fact never even happened. You want to sit up Mr. here and Brooks, talk about every who time has grace and all this. You're talking about someone with five kids that don't have custody. You need to stop None right now or you will be removed. Remove me then. All right. He will be removed. He cannot simply stay quiet when this court talks. I don't consent to this anyway. I don't consent to this just like I told you. I don't know the... He'll uh, be in recess until he's removed the I don't even the understand the, the true nature and cause.
seated, I'd need to first conform, confirm that Mr. Brooks is able to hear and see the court. We do have the audio and visual on. If someone, I can see on the screen, there is a head set on the table should he choose, but I have confirmation that the audio and visual are working in the other courtroom. Before I continue, of course, Mr. Brooks does have a right to be present for his sentencing. He's been present all along today up until his uh, disruption. Um, it was very clear to this court that he had absolutely no intention of stopping his tirade I think there's really no other way to describe it. Um, and this court needs to go through its remarks uninterrupted. And given the history in this case, which is well documented, of his disruptions and inability or unwillingness to follow the very simple rules of decorum and courtesy, which include not interrupting the court, um, I felt it important under Illinois versus Allen to remove him from the courtroom. As that is, of course, one of the options, and we have the benefit of the wonderful technology here in this courtroom and the adjoining courtroom, which I believe is the equivalent of being present. At what I will, what I have referred to at times during this trial as the functional equivalent of being present in this very courtroom. But it is important that I go through this without interruption to make the record that I need to make. I'm going to backtrack. No, you're not muted, sir. You're going to listen to me, and you're not going to interrupt. So I, I, I want to, I don't want to call it a tangent, but I'm looking for a note that I made. Then you need to pledge to this court, sir, that you will not interrupt me despite what you may not like me saying. Can you do that? He's not making that pledge, and under Illinois versus Allen, unless he makes that pledge, he's not coming back into this courtroom. You are not. All right, clearly he's going to keep repeating that statement, so I have muted him at this point. Um, it was my hope that he would honor the simple rule of courtesy and decorum that he show respect to this court, to these proceedings, and not interrupt and talk over me, but that clearly is something he is unwilling or unable to do. I'll find my note that I wrote later. Um, it had to do with, frankly, what this court has observed as a pattern with Mr. Brooks, and that is when testimony or statements by the court or statements by the prosecution team uh, become unfavorable to him, he lashes out and he disrupts. And that has been borne out time after time after time during this trial. So let me go through and pick up where I left off about the trial. I'm not going to go through everything in detail, but I, I think it's important that I set the stage, right, and the basis for my sentencing. One of the things that I did note regarding Erica Patterson's testimony, because frankly I wasn't sure where Mr. Brooks was going to go with his own defense, based on some of the remarks he made during um, his opening statement, which was actually later, but I guess I'll go back to my review of his um, recorded interview and some of the things that he tried to say, and at least it became apparent ultimately um, with the way he cross-examined witnesses, 
I wasn't sure if he would claim perhaps someone else was in the vehicle, he was afraid of police, um, the tinting of the windows, some of those things. Here's where it frankly doesn't matter, okay? Erica Patterson provided key testimony in this regard that there was no one else in the vehicle with Mr. Brooks. And I'm aware that he wants to come back, but until he writes me a pledge that he will not interrupt me, under Illinois versus Allen, he is not coming back in this courtroom. I'm not, he has forfeited his right to be present during my remarks. And unless he makes that pledge to me in writing, he's not coming back in. One of the things I tried to do in my preparation, and let me tell you, I reviewed all of my notes from this trial. I have, I think, nine notepads. I looked at just a couple of exhibits, but primarily uh, the map, Exhibit 15. I really wanted to determine for myself how long this carnage took. We know the distance, right, um, from at least where he entered. And you know what, Madam Clerk, put my um, screen up, will you? Um, sure. I'm going to put Exhibit 15 up because I think it's worth doing that. All right. We know he entered from White Rock where the first star is on the right side, where it says Fleet One, a marked sedan and marked SUV. Um, and that's where Detective Casey was. And so we know he goes one, two, three blocks before striking anyone. And then it's really about five blocks of what can only be described as chaos and carnage. We know we have from the evidence and the testimony, two different speed calculations. One from Bosco's, that was the surveillance footage, between 33 and 34 and a half miles per hour. And then we have one farther down from the footage from Curry Insurance, where it was an average 32 miles per hour. Now, I acknowledge math is not my strong suit. I did not do a calculation, but I don't think it took very long for all of this to happen. I think it was a matter of minutes. I think five minutes would even be far too long. It's probably three, maybe. And it was somewhat hard to gauge during the trial because of how the state presented, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but they were very meticulous in showing video, breaking it down, showing it at half speed, sometimes 30% speed, to really get an understanding of what was happening. And at no point did anyone ever tell me or tell the jury how long this took. But even though it took just a couple of minutes, there were so many opportunities for Mr. Brooks to simply stop, turn around, turn down other streets, before he ever crossed Barstow Avenue. And what we know is that at 437, Detective Tom Casey had the first police encounter with Daryl Brooks. Came face to face, Detective Casey at the hood of the car, coming eye to eye, that SUV brushed past him. And here's the thing. Detective Casey said he wasn't going very fast. To me, that tells me he had ample time to reflect about what he was about to do. If you look on that map, it's not a pledge. He's not coming in. When you come down White Rock, you can take a hard left on East Main Street. You can take what I call a soft left. I believe it's Pleasant Street. 
And Detective Casey, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't see it on the map. Frankly, you can turn around at any point in time on White Rock Avenue. But instead, and I, I think if you all try to picture this, as difficult as it may be, there's squads with lights. There's barricades. I know I read in, a, in the other act's motion that Mr. Brooks claimed at one point he was having a panic attack and he, again, maybe I think he was going to claim at some point he was afraid of police. Why drive toward them? Why take that right-hand turn? There's no reasonable explanation other than he was angry, he was full of rage, and he didn't care who he came in contact with, what he came in contact with, whether he drove past, through, at, he drove. Detective Casey pounded on the hood of that car, saw his face, again, was brushed by that SUV, thankfully not hurt. All of this preceded by the visual signs along White Rock Avenue of the staging of this parade. Floats, bands, banners, signs, people. And as you got closer to Main Street, the spectators lining those streets, which um, both, I believe, Detective Casey and Sergeant Warner said were thousands of people. Before he ever gets to Barstow Avenue, he comes in contact with, after Detective Casey, Officer Buttrin, and Officer Schneider. He has an opportunity, if you look at this map, he could go right on Buckley. Again, there might be police, there might be barricades. You simply stop. You ask, can I get out? No doubt in my mind, any police officer there would have done just that. He could have gone left on Northeast Avenue. Continuing down, he could have gone left on Martin Street. Continuing on, Barstow Avenue. This is where the parade participants, unfortunately, he's, he has contact with them. But he could have gone right on Barstow. He could have gone left on Barstow. And we know from some of the footage that we saw that his car was seen flying past, true not hitting one at this point, but flying past. There's no logical understanding for Mr. Brooks other than he's in the middle of a parade and he's about, he can see them. Anyone driving a vehicle would see what's ahead. And we know from this map, right, what was ahead of him. We saw that video footage. We heard the testimony. Many police vehicles at these intersections with their lights flashing. There's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Brooks would understand a parade was going on. You can turn off my uh, monitor, thank you. We also know it was not yet dark. Dusk, this was from the battalion chief who talked about when he arrived after that first alert at 439, it was not yet dark, it was dusk. I think that aids to the visibility that Mr. Brooks would have seen all of these people. This is not under cover of night. It's of course downtown Waukesha. We saw city lights and many of the street lights I'm referring to in many of the videos as well that would have been on or coming on. We know just past Barstow, he strikes his first victim, Nicole White. She was with Remax Services with the hot air balloon. If anyone's seen that, we saw it in the video, that is unmistakable what that is. That would get anyone's attention. If this was a mistake, if he was lost, this was his very first opportunity to stop and do the right thing after causing injury 
to a person. But he didn't. He did not stop. And then, of course, the walk yourself band. It's hard not to think about what I watched and not have this reaction. Those were images that frankly kept me up at night that I saw over and over and over. For their band director, she is a hero to me, to get up on the stand, to talk about, and that was Sarah Waymeyer Arparicio, to identify each one of her students, talk about their formation, talk about what she saw. So strong for all of you. Mr. Brooks had another opportunity to stop. This wasn't one isolated person that he could claim, I didn't know I struck someone. This was driving over people. What Kyle Jewell described as the SUV went over people like they were big old speed bumps. I know the green children were injured around there Thankfully, their physical injuries were minor, and I know I could probably spend a long time talking about the injuries of the band members, and I'm not going to go through that. They were significant. It was horrific. Thankfully, none of them were killed. And then, of course, moving on to Burr's logistics. Uh, between the band and the Blazers, that is where Kelly Graybow and her 10-year-old daughter, Adelia, were in that adorable Cindy Lou Who costume. And what struck me, and Kelly referenced this in her statement yesterday, was seeing the tires go past her head after she was hit. Adelia had major injuries as well. And then, of course, the footage from the Waukesha Blazers. And Jeff Rogers talked both at the trial, he testified, and he gave a statement yesterday about, again, having to come into this courtroom, talk about all of those who were with him, who were injured, and of course, little Jackson Sparks, another video that frankly is very difficult to watch and hard to unsee. You heard not only Jeff, but Josh Craner talk about what happened, and Josh, of course, being struck. And then the extreme dance group. I think it's fair that I didn't fully understand the extent of their injuries until hearing from many of the victims yesterday. I now understand why one of the girls called her aunt and said, my entire team is dead, because that's what it looked like. It was horrific. And to think of those two brave young ladies who got up during this trial to testify about what they saw, what they did, Jamie and Alyssa, your dancers are proud of you. And because of you, justice has been served. We heard from others, spectators, Deborah Ramirez, regarding herself and her son, that the vehicle was accelerating, not stopping. A moment that sticks out to me was really Mr. Brooks trying to chastise her for not seeking medical attention right away. Her response was perfect. She waited due to the number of injured and all the blood she saw. Understandable. 
not something to be chastised for. And then moving on, and again, I know I'm not mentioning everybody. These are just some of the highlights that, and I should call them lowlights, not highlights, but some of the testimony and evidence that really, really impacted the court. Stephanie Bonesteel and her husband testified about what Citizens Bank was doing, uh, hearing the impact against Jane, a very large thud and an audible gasp from the crowd. Her husband, Adam, was driving the support vehicle. And when he was being cross-examined about why he didn't see the driver, again, he just simply said, I thought it was my wife that had been hit. All I saw was the red poncho. And the only time we ever heard about brake lights was when Jane Kulik was on that vehicle and he braked so he could get her off the top and run her over. We heard from Matthew Harris who talked about the red SUV coming straight at them and then veering and going in the direction of the dancing grannies. And again, that audible gasp as he described that eerie sound He saw a child injured in front, Jane Kulik behind, actually the child and Jane Kulik behind and two victims ahead. He saw two of the dancing grannies. What he described as the SUV traveling faster than the speed limit. What I wrote down from his testimony is he's a combat vet and this is what he said. I've never saw anything like this in such a safe area. You could tell he felt bad about not seeking treatment right away for his daughter. He talked about how his wife's a nurse practitioner and again he didn't want to direct resources from other victims that we thought she was okay enough to be home with them. Now by this time in the parade it's very clear the spectators are noticing Something is not right. The sounds, the atmosphere has changed. They're screaming, there's gasping. There's a noticeable difference. It's at this point, I believe that Owen was struck, Kelsey was struck. Probably another miracle given the injuries she sustained with a tear in her spleen, significant road rash, cuts, requiring facial surgery. What Mr. Knapp described the driver as having eyes completely wide open. And then next we heard from Laura Thien, one of the dancing grannies. She talked about the sisterhood. Another brave woman came in, talked about what happened to that group. Seven people injured from her group, four fatalities. She said it all happened in a manner of seconds. All I seen was bodies. It looked like a war. The six people who were killed suffered multiple blunt force traumatic injuries, severe, significant, some dying instantly. I was impressed by both Dr. Scheel and Dr. Bizricki, Dr. Bizricki for her attention to detail, her looking at that vehicle, inspecting it, looking at the heights where certain damage was done and it being consistent in height with the individuals that she did the autopsies on. And of course, Dr. Scheel, and both of these individuals have testified before me, but Dr. Scheel, very shaken from the autopsy of little Jackson Sparks.
We then, continuing on, heard from Father Witter, very gracious man. He too talked about how he noticed something unusual, saw an SUV flying down the road, heard thuds. It was faster than anyone in their right mind would be going. He estimated it to be over 25 miles per hour. And then Lucas Hallmark, the off-duty police officer who was walking with his family on that day. He talked about the commotion behind, the large amount of screaming. You could feel it was palpable when he testified about having the wherewithal to try to get his kids out of the way, throwing his three-year-old as far as he could out of the way. You could see the pain on his face when he talked about not being that successful with his seven-year-old. He said, I wasn't quick enough. He testified that he thought this was a terrorist act, that SUV did not stop. I referenced the speed already, the ACE speed estimation from Detective Carpenter, 33 to 34 miles per hour, a little bit more than that. The speed calculation by Michael Smith from State Patrol from farther down the route of averaging 32 miles per hour. And then of course, the vehicle inspection by the state patrol finding no mechanical issues. There was also the Franklin assistant chief who attended the parade. He was near West Main Street in Maple. He provided the testimony regarding the SUV, the window being open, and the driver sticking his head out, looking out. He testified how he thought perhaps it was either a medical emergency, maybe even a mechanical issue, but it was clear once that SUV passed him and he saw that driver, he saw you, Mr. Brooks, no panic, no distress. His heart sank. He knew it was not a medical emergency. The body language just didn't fit. It did not believe it was mechanical at that point either. And then he saw the vehicle crank to the right. As he testified, he seemed excited about what he had done. Another off-duty police officer, this one from Wauwatosa, <clears throat> talked about how he saw Mr. Brooks after the fact crash the vehicle, hear him yell out an expletive and run southbound. With his sweatshirt still on, we all saw that video. Of course, at one point, Officer Skolton had contact. And as he testified, he put things together. Keep in mind all of the radio traffic, right, about one person, then like 15 people, and another 15. It was very apparent to him that although he was on the far end, he was around the dog leg on Wisconsin and Maine, that a vehicle had driven through the parade. He saw this vehicle. Of course, at that point, it was heavily damaged. He made the decision to use deadly force. What did he do after? What did Daryl Brooks do after? We crashed the vehicle. He fled the scene in a hurry. He changed his appearance, took off his sweatshirt, loses his shoes, I think in a hurry to get out of there, not caring that they had fallen off. He puts his hair up. We saw that on a number of videos. He asked unsuspecting people to use their phone to call an Uber. All within minutes of all of this happening. He was in such a hurry to get out of there, he left his phone in the SUV. He calls his mother, who arranges for an Uber. We heard from the Uber driver. He never showed up. It was nearby, ultimately, where he was found. And then, of course, the ring footage of his contact with Daniel Ryder. That is at 5.01 p.m. 
minutes, minutes after all of this happened. Mr. Ryder was astute, noticing that after Mr. Brooks being in his home for maybe eight to nine minutes, he saw squads driving by. I think you could say his gut told him something wasn't right. And he had Mr. Brooks go onto the porch, of course, after having given him a sandwich, given him a coat to wear, ultimately asks him for his coat back, and then of course the arrest. This is where some of the lies become evident. Mr. Brooks claims ultimately when he's being interviewed by Detective Carpenter, um, they have to actually seek medical clearance for him because he claims that he was thrown to the ground when he was arrested. He was not, the video is very clear. He cooperated, he laid down. There was no use of force used at all to take him into custody. But we know ultimately that he lies about what he was doing in Waukesha, where, how he got there, who he was with. He lies about having contact with Erica Patterson the day before. We know when he's found, he has the Ford key credit card, not only in his name, but one, whether it's a credit card or like a benefits card, but it's in the name of Erica Patterson and of course an ID for himself, a state issued ID. The Ford itself is registered in his mom's name. It's the same address that's on his ID. And there was documentation found in the Ford escape. He's now in custody. He's taken to the substation, ultimately taken to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. What's notable about the video and audio clips that this court reviewed from the hospital, Mr. Brooks is calm, he's coherent. There's no obvious signs of impairment, no obvious signs or really any signs of mental distress. He makes statements that he's not from the area. He doesn't appear disoriented or confused. At some point, there's kind of a jovial atmosphere between him and one of the detectives. The next day, he lies to Detective Carpenter, denies driving to Waukesha. I got a ride. He makes up the story about a tan Kia. He's very nondescript and vague with the information that he provides. And over the course of those five hours, he never once references the parade. He never once says there was another driver. Of course, they start talking to him initially about the domestic altercation because by that time, it's very clear a link had been made between Erica Patterson and the call uh, that police originally received of the domestic or at least an altercation near Frame Park and Mr. Brooks. And we also know because of the bond conditions in the two felony cases, he's not supposed to have any contact with her whatsoever, but he does. At no time during the five hours on November 22nd, does he make any admissions? Does he show any concern for any of the victims? No empathy, only lies, only concern for himself, for his family. Can I have a phone call? He does not provide, and I said this already, the name of anyone else that could be driving that vehicle. At one point, Detective Carpenter says, one of two people drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Either a God-fearing person who screwed up or the malicious guy. Daryl Brooks' response is, don't spin it. One of the things that has become abundantly clear throughout this trial, Daryl Brooks understands exactly what he's doing. His comprehension is fine. I have absolutely no concerns and have never had any concerns throughout this case and throughout this trial or even through the past day and a half regarding his competency. 
He's intelligent, he's deliberate, he's purposeful. He made nuanced arguments during this trial, one about the right to counsel versus the right to the assistance of counsel. That's a sophisticated legal argument, not the product of someone who doesn't understand. He asked questions on cross regarding tint, horns. Um, he brought up the recall after the fact. He talked and asked questions about, I should say, question about barricades, police being at the intersection. Although we never fully understood what his defense was, what became very apparent to me as I reread through all of my notes is that from the very beginning, he wanted to argue jury nullification. If you go back to his opening statements, he talked about power and the jury doing the right thing. He repeated that theme during his closing statement. At one point, he objected to evidence based upon a violation of one of the court's pretrial rulings. Again, a pretty sophisticated objection that resulted in the court striking an exhibit that had previously been received. Today, he spent close to two hours talking on his own behalf without any notes. He covered a variety of topics. I want to talk next about Here's my note that I found. One more thing on Mr. Brooks. You know, at times, right, we've seen the eye rolling, the fake clapping, the laughing, hand gestures, many times and most times very emotionless, unless he's doing those things, which would be really inappropriate and are inappropriate. His reactions are largely negative when things are not going his way. What did this community suffer as a result of this tragedy, this malicious conduct by Mr. Brooks? Well, I think many of the victims who spoke said it best. Lori Lockett described it as this, a sense of personal safety you robbed from us. I believe it was Bill Mitchell who said, the only life he seems to value is his own. Jason referred to it as evil. And he talked about innocence being stolen. He called the defendant a coward. No remorse. What he said is, you look like a monster. You look like such compassion. Margaret talked about the mental, physical, and emotional toll this has taken. She talked about how it was so tra traumatizing that her mind won't let her see everything that has happened and that she's worried when her mind might allow her to do that. I'm thankful that she's 95% back to normal. She talked about emotionally every day. She's reminded of the physical pain and the loss of self. But she's had tremendous support from family and friends and that today she will move on. Jeff Rogers also commented on the lack of remorse and sympathy for the victims. <laughs> how he has had to relive just the immenseness of this, the confetti parade, and how he recognized he was inches from losing three of his four kids just because of where they were located. He had flashbacks of grabbing his daughter's jacket, missing the first time that Riley gets up sometimes six, seven, eight times a night. How it's supposed to be a happy kick event for him as their new president and how after it happened and in the aftermath the weight of the moment and 35 people there trying to find everyone weighed on him 
He talked about the media showing up at his door and the emotional toll things have taken. It was intense and speaking at Jackson's funeral. He talked about how his faith is stronger. Again, very gracious, very inspiring. We heard next from Jessica and Juan and their, how this impacted them, the loss of their, son, their son's friend, Jackson. They were, their kids were involved in two different groups that day. One a dance group, not, not the extreme dance group, but a different one. And then of course the Blazers and how I believe it was Jessica who said, I yelled stop. I put my hands out as if I had the power. How she saw Jackson and how she will forever have that image burned in her memory. And that she was so grateful when she found her son. How she covered his eyes to shield him from what was around not once but twice they had to run because at first it was what happened through the parade and then the active shooter uh, situation because of obviously people didn't know who had fired the shots in that moment and she talked about pain and terror. Many people talked about PTSD. I mean for her I was really struck by how difficult it has been by, because of what she saw, not able to be a teacher, how she's hypervigilant, and every sound sends her into a panic, how her joy has been stolen, and how she does her best to hold it together for her kids. But when she was alone, she cried, she screamed, and only a month ago was she able to return to work, but in a very different capacity. She commented on the lack of remorse by Mr. Brooks and that he seems to search only for sympathy for himself. She said it, he will always be a danger to society. We heard from more individuals from the Blazers, again, a lot of discussion of PTSD. the sights and sounds of the SUV plowing through, the impact to her and the kids, the nightmares, how parking lots are problems, there's panic attacks, that no one will ever be the same. Of course, we heard next from the Sparks family. They're hurt, angry, they're traumatized, they're broken. It was difficult to even watch them make their statement. Their hurt is palpable. She talked about her last hug with Jackson. The horrible sounds she heard. She saw a police officer holding Jackson. She went to Tucker and that her world came crashing down. She talked about how she found a hat, both boys' hats, then shoes. And I didn't realize how significantly Tucker had been injured until she described that for us yesterday. How Tucker somehow blames himself for his not your fault, Tucker. It's Mr. Brooks' fault. One of the things when there is a fatality with all of these victims is the future that robbed from them, right? No future weddings, no future graduations, no future grandchildren or children no plans, it's just gone, it's all memories. And the contrast,
the contrast with, frankly, what Mr. Brooks will have, and that is even a life in prison, he'll make memories, he'll have phone calls, he'll have visits. He may even get to hug the people that he loves again. For the six individuals who lost their lives, that will never, ever be a reality. And that this family also talks about the lack of empathy, lack of remorse. I'm aware Mr. Brooks wants to come back. It says, I don't intend to interrupt in any way. That's not a pledge. He needs to pledge that he will not do so. I need that word in that statement. And if he does that, I'll bring him back in. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Some of the comments. The yells and screams from that night will haunt me for the rest of my life. I'm asking the court to give the max for each conviction because he has given the community a life sentence of these memories. I think it was Tyler's mom who talked about the community rising like a phoenix. You clearly have a phoenix for a son. He's strong. He got me a little bit with his comments. You're an amazing young man. You're a picture of resiliency, a fortitude of strength. I think what this community needs. I thought it was quite a testament that you took those pictures in the same, the same pictures of Jackson. You replicated that, and I thought that was a great tribute to him. You talked about, of course, rising up with Eric who had significant injuries as well, both of you, and how you fought back and each were able to play baseball. Even if not, obviously. And then we never heard from Joshua, who's haunted by survivor guilt. My heart breaks for her. She talked about feeling empty soccer, kicking leg would hurt from injuries she sustained, difficulty sleeping, with nightmares, physically and emotionally she stuck. She talked about maybe law school being in her firm. To her I say, don't give him the satisfaction of holding you back. Rely on your friends and your family and be the phoenix Tyler's mom spoke about. Jen Dunn read a statement from Sasha's mom, and I wrote this down. No one knows what it's like to stand on your feet when there's no floor. That's a pretty powerful image. I think that's very apt for what this community has gone through. We heard from others, including the Teagues. We saw photographs. So many families with more than one individual who was injured. how baseball for Eric was stolen, how he was such a good player. A lot about night terrors and, and PTSD and trauma. One individual talked to me and I would echo that. We heard about one band member who whose instrument may have very well saved his life. Someone described it as a mental massacre, though, the aftermath of this. It's difficult to go downtown. It's difficult to get restful slumber. Panic, panic attacks are common. Describe Mr. Brooks as sheer evil in its vilest form. 
I wrote down that despite all of the impact and karma, many people talked about for brokenness, sorrow, anger, hatred, regret, a lot of emotions, frankly, really no emotion shown by Mr. Brooks, certainly not for what he did on November 21st. We saw a lot of anger. Some of the people who lost loved ones, and understandably so. Many families were devastated. Nannies and grandmas were taken away. Yes, there were very specific terms used to describe Mr. Brooks, that in their opinion, he's a monster, he's a demon. Pure, unrepentant evil was one of the phrases that were used. Talked about the system failing us. Saw you in your SUV hanging out with a smile of satisfaction on your face. For one of Leanna Owen's sons, I lost my mom, and I wasn't always a good son. You can hear, right, the regret in that statement, because life is short, and these lives were taken far too short. We heard the very gracious, gracious statement from Michael Carlson, who unbeknownst to me had been writing Mr. in jail and sharing the gospel love of Jesus. He read a poem, which I thought was beautiful from the standpoint of his sister. And he said this, in that poem, it says, we both died that day. I, Samara, died to life. You died to the world. And then, of course, the Sorensen family next. They talked about never seeing their Grammy again. You murdered my mom. But at least I have some peace knowing she died doing something she loved. We heard from Brooke yesterday and today. She reread her statement due to the interruption. Proud of her for getting up here and sharing that. We talked about how compassionate each one of these individuals who died were. We heard about the compassion from Detective Casey that we learned about. It said Detective Casey came to our home to verify what we knew, and he could us every day of this trial. They ended with, angels watch over us. Six angels watching over us today. They asked me to hold Mr. Brooks accountable so that he will not have the opportunity to hurt anyone ever again. We heard from the Kulik family about the empty space that they have and the brokenness, lives being shattered by mom and grandma being taken away. We heard from her youngest daughter, Amanda. The grief was palpable, 17 and in high school as a senior of first year college. She talked about all of the things she will never have with her mom. Just the last year alone, an 18th birthday for her and her brother, graduation and beginning college. She lamented that her mom would never see her do her wedding vows, never see any kids that she would have, be a grandmother, be able to call her mom for parenting advice. And how excruciating it was for that family to wait three hours because of the chaos at the hospital. Talked 
about trigger, PTSD, sirens, things of that nature. And how she waited. She waited hoping that Daryl Brooks would have a reason. She also said this, no verdicts, don't bring my mom back. No more hugs, no more dinner, no more talks. My mom was the glue that kept our family together and we are falling apart. Moving on, Leanne talked about her safety and security being stolen by this defendant. She asked Mr. Brooks to picture his own daughter, unresponsive, lying on the ground with a leg injury, a head injury, and blood coming out of her mouth. She talked about the excruciating two weeks in the hospital, wondering if her daughter would ever live in a wheelchair and then walker for months. She said this, all you had to do was hit the brakes. I talked about being scared of everything, worried about a sister, being alone in a church for three hours on lockdown because of what was happening in the aftermath. And we heard next from the Urell family. A family that of course, was impacted significantly with four of their children, all of their children being struck by the SUV, with the mom, of course, having to testify in this case, being called by Mr. Brooks, which, of course, was his right to call witnesses. But it's the manner in which I think the indifference, not caring that this was someone who had four children impacted significantly. But clearly, you're raising your kids the right way the grace and dignity Charlotte got up and talked about. The basic things you learned in kindergarten. She described what she saw as being stupid, delusional, egotistical. She wanted to punch you in the face, and understandably so. I think your arrogance is pathetic. And her mom echoed those words. And then the gut-wrenching survivor guilt that you heard from her mom. She goes, I say this with a heavy heart. I have my kids here. I had to fight for my children. They will strive. And of course, we heard from Alyssa, her heart-wrenching moment. She was test bravely. But you could tell the impact that this had on her and what she saw in the aftermath to the extreme dance team. How one of the girls who at 10 years old, even lying on the ground being injured, had the wherewithal to ask, why would someone do this? If a 10 year old knew this, then the defendant knew this. And how she left the hospital not knowing if she would see some of her girls again. She was completely and utterly broken, forever changed by this event. She waited. She talked about how she waited for remorse, for empathy. It didn't happen. Murrell said something very yesterday, something we didn't hear about in the trial, but because of where he was at on the parade route, around the corner, waiting for his children, he didn't even know that all of them were in the parade, he said this, you hit the corner, sorry, you hit the brakes to go around the corner, and then you drove through a barricade where an officer shot at you three times. Those brakes were working. You knew how to use them, and you selfishly only used them so as to not crash your own vehicle as you fled the scene. Talked about walking through and around that corner 
through the wake of carnage, bodies all over, women, adults, children, deceased, people running all over. We heard from more of the members of the extreme dance team, either directly or parents and loved ones, how they had to walk through the carnage to find their children. Such a gracious statement of love. Talking about being a Christian and how she prays for him. Very powerful. Thank you for that. Her daughter, equally as powerful and brave and gracious. But even she knew, she said, that I thought about you every day. How could someone do this? More victims talking about PTSD. How even the song that was playing during the extreme dance team performance is a trigger for her PTSD. And how she's forgiven. We heard from the sister of victim HH how the first she talked about the sound of Vin Urell whimpering, crying, and then she found her sister, how her clothes were ripped off. She was unconscious, half naked. How she felt forgotten because her mom was at the hospital with her sister, of course, due to the severity of her injuries. Her sister was in a coma for eight, but how she has survivor guilt and issues like that, panic attack, she can't be around fireworks, tires screeching as a trigger, that this turned her life upside down. <coughs> and then, of course, we heard from Vinci herself. So brave to come here. I'm so very thankful you are recovering. Someone commented on how amazing it is to many people with their in recovery. Um, you wouldn't know by looking at them, of course, the emotional and mental injuries are significant and severe, but so grateful, frankly, lucky to be alive. I say to you, that scar on your neck should be a sign of strength and fortitude. You fought. You won. You have a story to tell. Don't shy away from it. Of course, we heard from her mother as well. We saw that PowerPoint with the pictures of their journey. The road rash on her face was horrific. You can only get a mental picture from words so much, but to see those actual pictures her in, being intubated, and oh, it's heart-wrenching. And all of the surgeries and the toll it took on their family. She described her daughter as a warrior. I think all of you here are warriors. We from Sam and her family and what she went through and how significant her injuries were and the, her mom talked about the haunting vision she has of just what she saw because of her perspective. It's the back of the pickup truck, she had a seat, a front row seat to horror. How she thought her daughter was dead because she was unresponsive and blood and really kind of the chaos and the confusion and not really even being able, being able to articulate what happened over the phone to her husband. She described what happened and reckless. Asking Mr. Brooks, how could you do this? What kind of father does that?
The last person we heard from was uh, victim, I think it's Gigi, the mother of FF. If I have it reversed, please excuse me. And how you could, she, I actually have her written statement that was provided earlier today, but how she was so taken aback by the conduct of Mr. Brooks that she frankly called him out on it yesterday because he was kind of motioning his hand like, okay, come on, let's get this over with, hurry up. And she yelled at him, you don't care. She goes, you hit me, I saw you, you knew. You're a child killer, you're a woman killer. She was so flustered, she had to really gather herself before she could continue. So again, I wanna thank the victims. I have other statements that I've read for people. Um, so gracious, I think they were all members of the Catholic communities. Their statements were translated, very gracious praying for Mr. Brooks. So I just wanted you all to know that I've taken all of these statements into consideration uh, today. I can't read your sign, Mr. Brooks. Can you hold it up closer? If it's a pledge that you will not interrupt me, I will bring you in for what will be the final section of my remarks today in the sentencing portion. Judge, I think you should give him that opportunity before you go through the, fa the uh, I'll do that. sentencing factor. I can read the top words of objection. But... <laughs> I can't it. He can bring this in with. We'll clear the and we'll take a short break, and I will bring him in, but I will warn Mr. You will go back to the room. You will forfeit your room to be present for the session. We'll be in race until we can get him back in.
Thank you. Please be seated. The records should reflect that uh, it's 4.53. Mr. Brooks is back in this courtroom. Mr. Brooks, the only way I will honor that request is if you specifically waive your right to know. Without that, um, not a convenience for you over there. It's you go over there, frankly, demand removal under Illinois. Anything. So you can see. I didn't meet here. All right, Mr. Brooks, you please sit changing, down. You keep changing. And I'm going to continue with my sentencing remarks. You keep changing the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction is a jurisdiction that yet to be proven on the record. In Mr. Brooks, court and in this one. please sit down. I would like to go back to the other court. It's not a courtesy to you. If you'd like to specifically waive your right to be physically present, then I will entertain that. Otherwise, never, you need to sit down. I never waived. To, I never waived the right to not be present. That's because you to, forfeited your right I to be present by anything, conduct. Your Honor, You're now wrote, back in this courtroom. Your Honor, I wrote three. I did what you asked me to do. You, you said, never once pledged to me, sir, that no, you would not interrupt. And you, you demonstrated that you continue to interrupt. Man, I'm trying to hear all that because at the end of the day, what you asked me you told me you to tell me. This is not a debate. You told the bailiff to it's tell not me. That I debate. Had to you write. asked to come over and I honored that. Well, I, and I exercised my right three times. I shouldn't have had to do it three times. None of those opportunities that you wrote to me, I I never had that before. You've never you've never required that before. That is actually not true. You've never required that before. Every time that I've been brought over there after some time, sometimes very short. Sometimes an extended Mr. Brooks, period of time. You are just simply to delay the inevitable. Please sit down. I don't down. care about the inevitable. It was I already written from day one what was going to happen. That it doesn't make me lose any sleep about that. I know what, I'm okay. I'm okay with everything. Then please I just sit wanna down. Be, I just want to be treated fairly, which please, I have not been. Please sit down. And then you honor. And then you Mr. always make this it is like not you a all make it seem like it's some type of aim, and it's not. Please sit down. We're talking about constitutional rights. You just told me, or you told the bailiff to tell me that I had to write to exercise a right that I should already have. I did that. Not once, not twice, three times. And it still wasn't honored. If you raise this, I'm, Mr. I'm this for like 20 minutes You're saying I want, I want to come back. I'm doing this. You're right. now. Can I come back? Can I come back? Can so I come sit back? down. It wasn't honored. And then I had, so I, I said, okay, finish. I'll write this and I'll see if your honor can see it on the, the objection sign saying, Mr. I've Brooks, exercised my right to be present. If you stop for May a I minute, have the order of the court. I'll explain it, but you have to stop I'm, so I'm I can explain it. Your honor, you've never, I did what you asked me to do. Actually not. Yes. Let me explain then, and if, if I you would like. If I didn't, your honor, if I did not do what you asked me to do, then why did I? Why was I allowed to come back if I did not do what you asked me? Because to do? I'm frankly going to a very distinct portion of this hearing where I am going to impose sentence. Okay, that doesn't answer. That me, matters. Though, that doesn't answer. Me. Please sit down, Wait. and I will explain and right. remain quiet with without due, interrupting me. With all due respect. That doesn't mean you're respecting me. You, so please you, sit down. With all due respect, you know the bailiff. When I when I first said, because every time that I've been brought over there. In the past, Mr. Brooks, you all waited, I don't you, need a history you lesson always of what I've that when I exercise my right to be true. Untrue. We said Untrue. we have the record. We have the record. Dig into the record. Mr. Brooks. I, I know what you I know what the requirement was of me going in uh, going over there. You've always stated on the record that when I exercise my right to be present, you will bring me back if I'm if uh, I will follow the rules of decorum. That's it, your exact words, which you said every time. Which you're I've demonstrating never, right now that had, you have absolutely your Honor, your no Honor, ability to do. With all due respect, I've never had to go through any type of certain words that needed to be needed to be said or stressed or anything like that before. I've always done it that you've asked me to do it. No different than today when I told the bailiff I would like to be present. You told the bailiff if he wants to be present, he has to put it in writing. And pledge I, me I that he will in, not interrupt me. I put it in writing. Without a pledge. 
so so why am I here? Because I'm going to move on to another phase of this hearing, and I thought it important that you be here in person. So, so I was here. But you didn't reclaim your right to be back here. Then why am I, I here? Am then you're out. Okay, happen. and and I, and I and I respect that you're allowing it, but it's still answer the question. It does not have a question. Mr. Brooks. As a, Your Honor, as a Brooks. servant, I have the right to question Sir, of Your Honor. I'm going to ask you one more time, and if you refuse to sit down, then you are in direct disobedience of a court order. Sit that, down and be quiet so I can make the appropriate can record. You, can you tell me what the, um, the court right, order he's is? He's not going to obey. He's now forfeited his right to be present. Obey. He will go into the other courtroom. I didn't say I wasn't going to obey. He'll we'll be I'll in just recess until the he's order. there. I just asked, what is the order? I didn't, I didn't say. Thank you. Please be seated. Of 
course, I do need to first verify that they can hear and see us. I'm getting the thumbs up. We are back on the record. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is no longer in the main courtroom. He's in the adjoining courtroom. Um, I, of course, have been hearing on the side of constitutional caution, but I will note that his right to be at sentencing is a statutory right, um, which we probably don't need to go through these under Illinois. Um, but I did. Um, but or whether it's a statutory right or a constitutional right, forfeit that right, and his behavior today has certainly demonstrated that he has forfeited his right to be present in this courtroom uh, during my sentencing remarks. He immediately came in. Um, I was on the bench looking through my paperwork. Uh, the courtroom wasn't even open, uh, and he started asking me questions. I said I wasn't going to answer them. He really had no respect for the record decorum. Um, he needed it to be on the record. He d didn't seem to care about that. Um, wanted to debate me about my prior rulings. Uh, bottom line is, it's a statutory right to be present, and uh, he forfeited that. Right. Um, and I would just add that it's part of a pattern that has been demonstrated uh, during this trial that when uh, my perspective, things are not going in his direction, things are being said that he doesn't agree with, uh, that he tends to act out, he disrupts, um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Once again, I'll confirm he can he hear and see. We've got confirmation from the staff in the other courtroom. Um, one of the reasons I really spent the time going through uh, both my observations of uh, Mr. Brooks in terms of the mental health related issues and uh, first and then going through the uh, victim impact statements or I go through all of the necessary factors for sentencing. Basically, it's challenging to talk about the impact of victims without getting emotional. Um, this trial is unlike anything that I've ever been a part of. The magnitude of the crime, the number of people impacted, how they were impacted, the vicious, senseless nature of it, um, and hearing about the impact of all of that on our community members and the people who are at the parade, um, it's heart-wrenching. And um, I wanted to do that before I really got to the meat of sentencing, um, because I also thought it was important to really spend some time recognizing, acknowledging the impact to the direct victims uh, or in this courtroom and who have provided statements. Today, my focus in sentencing will be about November 21 of 2021, the events shortly before that, leading up to it and after. And I'm not about Mr. Brooks's conduct during the trial, even though case law is clear that his conduct at trial can and is a legitimate factor for the court to consider, um, I need to make the record very clear that in no way what I do here today is based on Mr. Brooks exercising his right to a trial. That is a firmly embedded constitutional right, which I assert, which I upheld. Um, of course, every person charged with a crime has a right to a trial. This court honored that right. I protected that right, even if Mr. Brooks treated it with contempt, disrespect, and at times like a game. But sentencing today is directly related to his conduct on November 21 of 21 and the other sentencing factors, which, as I indicated previously, include the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and his character and rehabilitative needs.
Today I am tasked with sentencing Daryl Brooks for 76 counts related to a couple of moments in time. Moments that are tragic, moments that were frankly avoidable. My sentence here today is the purposes of it are twofold, really threefold if we think about the community. One, it is punishment. Two, protection of immunity. And three, what I hope is justice and closure for the families and the community at large. I, of course, want to recognize and give due respect to the guilty verdicts that were rendered by the jury in this case. Not just 76 guilty verdicts, but the verdict questions that they entered, including for counts one through six and seven through 67 that had the special verdict question related to the use of a dangerous weapon. So let me talk about the seriousness of this offense. The seriousness of the offense can be summed up, frankly, in one word, and that is attack. There is nothing, no other word that can best describe what happened on November 21 of 2021 than the word I talked about my remarks regarding the trial, about the opportunities that Daryl Brooks had to avoid this altogether. I put Exhibit 15 on the screen for a bit, which had the exhibit that detailed the map. The map of the parade, it starts with white rock, shows where uh, Sergeant Warner was at one point uh, farther up that parade route, uh, the staging area, and I think if you look further up on 15, it even depicts where Rock School is, and that of is where um, we saw the video of the altercation between Mr. Brooks, Corey Rung, Nicholas Kirby, Erica Patton. Now, of course, there were ones before that but that is really the where things started where I believe Mr. Brooks boiled over with rage and anger that he was not to control on this he had a number of opportunities to simply drive the other direction down White Rock chose to drive toward Main Street, even though from the testimony, we know it was very evident that it was staging for a parade. There were many people, may not have been exactly by the school, but farther down White Rock, from Niagara forward is where that staging area was located and many people were there. The sights and sounds of a parade, the signs on the side of the road telling people not to park there, for example. Instead of turning around or instead of turning left onto East, East Main Street or left onto Pleasant, and despite Sergeant Warner trying to flag him down with and being in front of a squad with lights and a clear indication you should listen to or honor the even gestures of a police officer and he was in uniform he drives down white rock avenue and has contact with detective casey who very clearly did everything he could to stop mr brooks 
and in that moment thinking it's a lost motorist. But Mr. Brooks chose to basically brush him aside with that SUV and drive on to Main Street, past more people, past many spectators, and in a manner that was not just at a speed inappropriate for a parade, but frankly, that was reckless and endangered anyone who was on the roadway at that time, whether or not he hit anyone between White Rock and Maine and Barstow and Maine. But during that three block section of Main Street, he could have turned off Buckley, Northeast Avenue, Martin Street, or in either direction on Barstow. He could have stopped, asked for the police barricades to have been removed, or frankly, turned his car around even at that point, gone back the way that he had come. But he didn't do that. He chose to drive recklessly, carelessly, maliciously through a parade route and at anyone in his path where he struck not one, not two, not three, but 68 different people. We actually know that number's higher because we now know, um, we heard from uh, the two individuals who are with Extreme Dance, the one girl who was struck by one of the individuals who was clearly struck and that person flew into her. That would qualify for a charge based upon the state's description of how they chose to charge, it's just they didn't know until closer to the sentencing hearing. So 69 individuals if you include her. There are so many aggravating factors here, it's frankly difficult to even keep track of them all. The complete disregard for the lives of anyone else that day. Someone described it as depraved indifference, and I think that is the perfect phrase to capture the actions of Mr. Brooks on November 21st of 2021. The aggravated factors, the numerous opportunities to turn around or not even enter the parade route or simply to stop. The fact that he mowed over and used that vehicle as a battering ram to hit 68 individuals, never once stopping with rage and anger at suspecting people at the parade who were there simply to kick off the holiday season to experience joy with families. The intentionality of the conduct outstanding. The viciousness, the speed, swerving from side to side at various points. This is a case of who done it. From the very beginning, from when this case was charged, it was clear who did this. Now that is not to say that I prejudged this case, I did not. But after sitting through this trial, after watching the many videos, after listening to the testimony of the many, many dozens of witnesses, it is clear the state had overwhelming evidence of Mr. Brooks's guilt. What's also aggravated is his complete and utter lack of remorse. He spoke here today for two hours, one sentence, that's it. Dark, no detail, hours, one sentence. No empathy for any of these individuals, at times mocking them with hand gestures, or rolling his eyes multiple times 
That is not an indication or a sign of someone who has empathy, who is sorry for what he has done. We may never know the true why, but we were provided with nothing here today other than a feeble attempt to blame mental health, which frankly does a disservice to those who truly suffer from mental health issues. I understand why his family might cling to that because of the difficulty in coming to grips with a loved one doing such heinous things. But for Mr. Brooks, it's nothing more than indifference, action, and action of what he did and the impact that he has caused as a result of his heinous actions. I searched for a mitigating factor in this case. I waited patiently for an apology, a true apology. I didn't get it. And not for my benefit, but for the victims. The law allows me to look at things such as Mr. Brooks's prior history, including the history of criminal offenses and pending charges, the history of undesirable behavior patterns, which can include dismissed, uncharged, or unproven offenses or facts, even including expunged offenses, not really relevant here, acts resulting in probation revocation. Of course, those are part of his criminal history, nothing specific to these charges. I can look at his personality, character, and social traits, the vicious or aggravated nature of the crimes, the degree of his culpability, his, de his demeanor at trial and truthfulness, his age, his educational background, and employment record, his remorse, repentance, and cooperativeness, his need for close rehabilitative control, the rights of the public, the recommendations of the interested parties, including victims and family members of homicide victims. I can consider statements made by his own family. I can certainly consider the length of pretrial detention, which I'd note, though, when facing six Life sentences is really a fraction of the time available to this court. The loss of life in this case is certainly one of the aggravating factors today. The number of people injured also an aggravating factor. The reach into the community certainly palpable because this was a Christmas parade. I think it was a comment earlier either today or yesterday that this was not like an one act where Mr. Brooks drove into a crowd of people. This was sustained driving from block to block to block to block, picking off people that were unsuspecting. 68, 69 times driving over people as if they were nothing more than speed bumps.
What's also aggravated is his conduct after he drove through the parade. Crashing his vehicle in an attempt to flee is pretty evident based upon the evidence and testimony from trial that Mr. Bragg had no idea there are these logs in that backyard that could damage his vehicle. He was attempting to flee when he ran over them, and it ultimately disabled that vehicle, and he was forced to abandon it. He ditched it, leaving personal identification information in it and his phone in a clear attempt to get out of there in a hurry. And then we have that series of videos that we saw at trial of him going through backyards, coming in contact with people, asking to use phones, ultimately ending up at Mr. Ryder's home, who graciously took him in. Never once, Mr. Brooks, showing any signs of distress of any emotion of what he had just done, cool, calm, collected. Certainly not a sign of someone who had any remorse for what he had just done. Someone who's involved in an accident, even a tragic accident, one where they flee the scene and are later caught, oftentimes show incredible remorse, tears. Not tears for themselves, but tears for what they've caused. A recognition of the loss of life, for example, from their conduct. An individual who simply wanted to flee. That is the epitome of consciousness of guilt evidence. Fleeing. Changing your appearance, taking off the sweat, not even get your shoes or off your feet because so intent on fleeing the area, putting your hair up from it being down. No doubt this is by far and away one of the most aggravated cases I've ever presided over, the sheer magnitude of the loss, the number of victims, the types of crimes for which the jury has convicted him, six counts of intentional homicide, 61 counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety, six counts of hit and run, two counts of felony jumping, one count of misdemeanor battery, What's further aggravated is the fact that he was out on bond. He should have had no contact with Erica Patterson. But the rules mean nothing to Mr. Brooks. Nothing. This was someone who on... Two prior occasions charged with, frankly, causing mayhem. One, a reckless endangering safety for discharging a firearm. The other for battering and then running over Erica Patterson's foot. This court does get to consider the other acts evidence that the state sought to introduce at trial. That other act evidence includes that on November 2 of 21, Milwaukee Police took a complaint from Erica Patton that Mr. Brooks had run over her with his vehicle and tried to kill her. She had tire marks on her right pant leg she could not move her leg and had blood coming from her mouth. On that date, Mr. Brooks was driving the same vehicle that he drove through the parade. 
Erica Patterson was conveyed to Freighter Memorial Hospital. Her injuries received medical attention. She even had that boot on her leg on November 21 of 2021. She described Mr. Brooks to police as yelling at her, using profanity, as she tried walking past him when she was at a gas station. I think initially before that, at another location, but ultimately where he allegedly ran over her was at a gas station and caused the injury to her leg. Struck her in the face once with a closed fist, causing pain and bleeding without her consent. And then it was after she walked away that he followed her. When police had contact with him, he denied driving his mother's vehicle. Police had contact with him at his house. He ignored their cans in the vehicle, claiming that he was having an anxiety attack upon the site of the squad car and needed to get into the home to get his inhaler. <coughs> when I say the rules don't matter to Ms. Brooks and court orders mean nothing, Mr. Brooks was in custody and there are jail phone calls berating Erica Patterson, encouraging her to recant, blaming her for what had happened, saying things on that phone call like, you trying to make it seem like everything is always everyone else's fault but yours. Like you don't never do anything to cause shit. And the whole cause of this shit was something that you fucking did. He ended the call by telling Erica Patterson, you did this shit. You couldn't even keep your mouth shut after numerous people told you that shit. This ain't the place for you to be doing this shit. And you still ran your mouth. And I'm the one sitting in here facing all this time. He repeatedly calls her. A phone call on November 11th, Daryl overheard or captured saying, Why in the hell would I just look her down knowing I? like that like okay i probably got a few screws loose i ain't hardly no goddamn fool he's complaining that she won't post his bail you didn't put a cent my bail why should someone else have to pay for some shit you caused Apparently of that conversation, at least moments later, he says to her, nah, I didn't try to do anything because if I tried to do something, you wouldn't be on the phone now. That's not realizing. If I really tried to do something, you wouldn't be on the phone now. That is the rage and the anger that Mr. Brooks had on November 21 of 2021 when he down Erica Patterson, confronted her, that it wasn't about him getting money from her, like he lied to Detective Carpenter about. This was to confront her. He clearly hit her, we know that. This is the type of man that drove through the Christmas parade enraged because frankly it's entirely possible that Corey Runkle and Nicholas Kirby saved the life of Erica Patterson. It, it's clear Mr. Brooks was hell-bent 
to cause harm to her, but she was able to get free, run back to her friends. Who knows what would have happened but for their intervention. If you think back testimony of Nicholas Kirby, he felt bad for threatening Mr. Brooks, like somehow this was his fault. He was just trying to be there for his friend, someone he recently met. So Mr. Brooks, that other act's evidence is a very clear indication of your poor moral character. It demonstrates unequivocally that you have absolutely no remorse for anything that you do. You have no empathy for anyone and that you are justified in the actions that you take. In addition to that conduct, as part of your character, this court is able to look at and consider your prior record. And I'm well aware, sir, that you're raising an objection sign, but you have forfeited your right to be here, and I will not stop, and you will not be brought into this courtroom. I will continue. Prior record, going back to Two thousand and two thousand span what Nevada, Georgia, at least police contact in Georgia. We have an unknown disposition in Wisconsin. Substantial battery in two thousand to a crime. Put on probation, ultimately that was revoked. He went to prison. Felony possession of THC, 2003, resisting obstructing jail time, 2005, a disorderly conduct ticket, but he failed to pay the forfeiture and ended up serving an alternate alternative to incarceration. Sorry, he ended up serving um, for failing to pay 30 days jail. 2009, obstructing two days jail, meaning he lied to police. 2010, strangulation, battery was dismissed and read in, put on probation, ultimately revoked, serving 11 months jail. 2012, misdemeanor bail jumping, possession of THC, with a number of other charges being dismissed and read in, 180 days jail concurrent. So 2012, a misdemeanor resisting or obstructing, so he from to make their job more difficult, 37 jail consecutive. In Nevada in 2006, domestic battery, a suspended sentence, obstructing after being found guilty at trial for which he served jail time. 2007, statutory sexual seduction as a felony. This is for impregnating Erica Patterson when she was a minor. 2016, charged with uh, not being in compliance with the sex offender registry uh, requirements for which there is an outstanding warrant. In Georgia, a 2021 arrest for battery domestic violence, presumably with Erica Patterson based upon where she came from at that time. But I won't make it, I say presumably, but frankly, it doesn't matter who it was with. We also know that there's the 2003 paternity case out of Washington. County. Why is that relevant? Because eight times during that case, a warrant has been issued for contempt court for to pay his financial obligations to a child or children. The pending cases for which he One pending case, I should say, he was, I don't believe, charged with bail jumping for that one. Uh, the 20 CF 2550, two counts of recklessly using a weapon, felon in possession of a firearm, 
released ultimately in March of 2021. He's accused in that case of firing a shot. There were two, two occupants in a vehicle. One was his nephew, and when he was picked up by police, a loaded Beretta, 9 millimeter, which had previously been reported as stolen, was found in his possession. We talk about acts evidence, that is, the, uh, for which he was charged with felony bail jumping, the secondary recklessly endangering safety for allegedly running over Erica Patterson, the battery DV, DC DV, and a resisting obstructing. And then the second would be those, he was charged with intimidation of a victim, felony bail jumping for conduct on November 8th. So November 2nd, November 8th. This is clearly someone with a demonstrated violent history and past, someone who has absolutely no regard for anyone but himself. To say that he is a lifelong criminal, I think is accurate. He disobeys law enforcement, he disrespects court orders, and he certainly demonstrated that he has no respect for these proceedings. Multiple acts of violence violent, dangerous behavior that predated the attack on the Waukesha Christmas Parade. His character, or lack thereof, is also demonstrated by his complete and utter denial of culpability in this case. Blaming of his mental health or alleged health. There's no evidence that he was suffering from a manic episode. I went through all of that earlier today, going through the four reports related to the special plea. None of those doctors found support for his special plea. Brooks talked about at times this being the will of God or that all things happen for a reason. I tell you, Mr. Brooks, you are not an instrumentality of God. It may be inevitable to all of us, but you cut the lives of six individuals short. You, you alone, Mr. Brooks, cut the lives of these six innocent people short. I talked earlier about how I believe intelligent, deliberate, and purposeful he does. I considered that your treatment needs. Perhaps there are intersecting mental health issues as it relates to your personality disorder, but those issues can best be addressed in a confined setting where the Department of Corrections will be charged statutorily to evaluate you and to provide any medical or mental health treatment that you need. This is a case that falls squarely on the need to protect the community. I referenced this earlier. There's really three primary reasons for the sentences I will impose here today. One is punishment, one is to protect the community, and the other is to provide justice and closure to the victims. Because under that category of need pact, the court does get to consider the impact of these crimes on the victims. I went through at length in reviewing all of those victim impact statements. I certainly didn't go through every single one, to highlight some of them. Doing so with purpose, because it is very clear to this court that Mr. Brooks has caused carnage, mayhem, 
It has resulted in many people suffering P from PTSD, from mental and emotional trauma that will take a lifetime to recover from, and for some, perhaps, if at all. You have taken away from these individuals future memories. They will never have birthdays with the six individuals who were killed. There will be things. There will be graduations. There will be none of the milestones that these families were looking forward to, whether it be for a, an innocent eight-year-old or an innocent 79-year-old. Frankly, Mr. Brooks, no one is safe from you. This community can only be safe if you are behind bars for the rest of your life. The actions of Daryl Brooks demand punishment. The community is not safe from your violent and criminal conduct unless you are in custody. You left a path of destruction, chaos, death, injury, confusion, and panic as you drove seven or so blocks through the Christmas parade, never once seeing or seemingly caring about the wake of carnage you left. Four of those blocks were turned into a scene that frankly is no different than a war zone. On counts one through six, this court is imposing a life sentence without the possibility or eligibility for supervision consecutive to one another. One life sentence for Virginia Sorensen. One life sentence for Leanna Owen. One life sentence for Tamara Durand. One life sentence for Jane Kulik. One life sentence for Bill Hospel. And one life sentence for Jackson Sparks. I've considered the enhancer and the additional five years that I could impose, but I don't need to really order that because I've not made him eligible for extended supervision and it would only be to increase his time on initial confinement. But make no mistake, Mr. Brooks, you use that vehicle as a battering ram, no different than frankly a firearm. On counts 7 through 67, these are 61 counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety. These charges alone and these convictions without the enhancer carry a maximum of 12 and a half years. Because of the enhancer, a total of 17 and a half years. And under Wisconsin law, the five years is added to the initial term of confinement. So what could be seven and a half years is a maximum of 12 and a half years. And I'd ask that everyone no longer show any reaction to the sentence so I can get through this. On counts seven through 67, on each count, I will impose a total sentence of 17 and a half years. 12 and a half years of initial confinement plus five years of extended supervision consecutive to any other sentence that I've imposed here today. That is 762 and a half years of initial confinement and 305 years of extended supervision on top of the life sentences that I've imposed. That is 17 and a half years, sir, for Noel White. 17 and a half years for Eleanor Andrews. Anders, excuse me. 17 and a half years for Sasha Catalan Castillo. 17 and a half years for Maura Gilchrist. 
17 and a half years for Justin Gullickson. 17 and a half years for Harry Gilfoy. 17 and a half years for Aiden Lofgren. 17 and a half years for Theo Mazda. 17 and a half years for Tyler Pugliner. 17 and a half years for Connor Tank. 17 and a half years for Eric T. 17 and a half years for Adelia Mafioli. 17 and a half years for Kelly Graybow. 17 and a half years for Josh Craner. 17 and a half years for Riley Rogers. 17 and a half years for Caden Rogers. 17 and a half years for Tucker Spark. 17 and a half years for Isabella Bartlett. 17 and a half years for Yurisi Becerra Montez. 17 and a half years for Samantha Coelho. 17 and a half years for Madden Hollingsworth. 17 and a half years for Mackenzie Hollingsworth. 17 and a half years for Mitchell Lampine. 17 and a half years for Kathleen Peelmeyer. 17 and a half years for Julia Schleichow. 17 and a half years for Olivia Stover. 17 and a half years for Jennifer Stover. 17 and a half years for Jessalyn Torres. 17 and a half years for Alice Urell. 17 and a half years for Charlotte Urell. 17 and a half years for Vivian Urell. 17 and a half years for Jackson Urell. 17 and a half years for 17 and a half years for Tamara Rosentrier. 17 and a half years for Betty Yang. 17 and a half years for Marie. Alvarez Dominguez. 17 and a half years for Gregoria Romelia Perez. 17 and a half years for Elliot Hallmark. 17 and a half years for Benjamin Hallmark. 17 and a half years for Patrick Heppy. 17 and a half years for Lori, Lori Locken. 17 and a half years for Marisol Lopez Gutierrez. 17 and a half years for Adair Lopez Rubelar. 17 and a half years for Juan Marquez. 17 and a half years for David Marquez. 17 and a half years for William Mitchell. 17 and a half years for Jason Petchloff. 17 and a half years for Margaret Pachulis. 17 and a half years for Yamalette. Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Island Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Ashley Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Jose Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Maria Perez. 17 and a half years for Camila Perez Gonzalez. 17 and a half years for for Isaac, 17 and a half years for Deborah Perez, 17 and a half years for Charles Green, 17 and a half years for Lily Green, 17 and a half years for Brinley Harris, 17 and a half years for Kelsey Knapp, 17 and a half years for Owen Piotti. On count 68, 73, which are the six counts of hit and run resulting in death. These are 25 year felonies each. The court will do the following. On count 68, a 25 year total sentence, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision. This will be concurrent to count one. Count 69, the same sentence, 25 years total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count, six, to count two. 
Did I say that the right way, the first one? Okay, count 68 is concurrent to count one. Count 69 is concurrent to count two. Count 70, 25 years total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count three. Count 25 years total, 10 years of initial confinement, 10 years of supervision, current to count four. Count 72, 25 year total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count five. And on count 73, a 25 year total sentence, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count six. On count 74 and 75, the two felony counts of bail jumping, the court is ordering a six year sentence total on each count, three years of initial confinement, three years of extended supervision, consecutive to all other counts, but concurrent with one another. And lastly, but certainly not least, the maximum sentence for the battery to De Erica Patterson, nine months consecutive to any other sentence. To order anything other than what I have done, sir, would be to unduly depreciate the seriousness of these offenses. Which it is needed, although largely symbolic, in the number of years that I have imposed here today because frankly, you deserve it. I know it's symbolic, but it needs to hold you accountable in a very real and tangible way. For all of these sentences that I have imposed, I will order the following conditions. No contact with the victims as identified in the amended victim key or their families. No contact of any kind with Erica Patterson you are to pay restitution in the amount of $47,193.29 to EMC Insurance Company, that's on behalf of the Waukesha School District, and $124,220.65 to the Crime Victim Compensation Program. I am ordering DNA surcharges on all counts. On counts 1 through 75, it's $250. On count 76, it's $200. Those are mandatory under the law. I'm also imposing domestic abuse charge on $100. I'm also imposing standard court costs on all counts. Although my primary emphasis that restitution be paid for costs, surcharges, and fees, I will order that restitution costs and fees be paid out of prison money. Um, in other words, that all financial obligations shall be collected pursuant to statutory provisions as requested by the state. That's frankly a standard, it's customary, uh, but it will be in the judgment of conviction. And then pursuant to 949.165, I'll find that it is appropriate for this court to order an escrow account under 949.165 for payment of restitution Coffee and even for costs associated with prior legal representation or future representation under the statute. Mr. Brooks has been convicted of a number of serious crimes for which this section is appropriate. I will order 360 days credit as to count one and count 68. Only all other counts, zero days credit because of the consecutive nature of these sentences that I've imposed here today. I calculated that uh, with my sentence calculator, of course, that is through yesterday because the sentences come today. There are a number of advisements I must go through. Um, first of all, Mr. Brooks will be provided with a explanation of determinate life sentence regarding uh, the first degree homicide charges. Of course, he's not eligible for extended supervision form uh, defined uh, extended assignment for him. And there's um, other language on here that he can read at his convenience. He also will be provided with the notice of right to seek post-conviction relief form. Um, the court will fill out the caption for him. He is instructed to review it. 
uh, and review the defendant's acknowledgement, make the appropriate selection, sign, and date it, and return that to the court. I must advise you, sir, you have been convicted of a felony. That means you may not vote in any election until your civil rights are restored. You may not possess a firearm. You may not possess body armor. Both those are punishable as felonies. You also have 20 days from today's date to appeal decision of this court. Does the state believe I've overlooked anything here today? No. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, those documents will be provided to Mr. Ross. We'll note for the record that many times during my final sentencing, he was holding up an objection. That objection is noted for the record. This concludes the hearing in this case. We are now off the record. Motion to stay pending the judgment of conviction. Okay. Um, I'm not making really determinants. Uh, regarding where he be held, um, that certainly is within the once the judgment of conviction of signed is signed, I'll address the motion for stay pending appeal. Uh, but my understanding is he needs to be transported to Milwaukee, and I will not. This, I will not stand in the. All right, schedule that once the judgment of conviction is signed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.